Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. I should warn you at the start of this video, I'm not feeling particularly good at the moment. Don't worry, it's not the dreaded man flu, it's not as bad as that, I'll probably live. I just have a bit of a nasty cold, uh, which is a bit of a bummer because there wasn't a lot that I wanted to talk about in this episode, and I'm not sure I'm going to have time to cover it all. Tell you what, let's start off with something that's just a bit of fun. Something completely trivial and unrelated to games. Well, not entirely unrelated to games. I recently got around to watching Jurassic World The Fallen Kingdom. Now, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it, is, it is spectacularly dumb, even by Hollywood standards. But I'd been playing the Jurassic World game. Uh, you may remember the video series, and I thought, you know, it's about time. I should probably get around to watching the new movie, since so many dinosaurs in the game were from the new movie. But I kind of like Chris Pratt. He's a pretty charismatic actor, and Bryce Dallas Howard's always good, and Jeff Goldblum's almost always good, even though he was pretty much just phoning it in in this movie. Um, so I sat down and watched it. Well, I tried to watch it. I mean, I did eventually watch it all, but about halfway through my first attempt at viewing, I just got so insulted at how incredibly stupid the filmmakers seem to think I am. Um, but I, I just, out of a sense of outrage, <laughs> I stopped watching halfway through. And I only went back and finished watching it about a week later because I just thought, you know, screw this, I've paid for this movie, I'm going to get my money's worth. Although, to be completely honest, I think if they'd paid me to watch the movie, I still would have felt cheated. And while it was in no way nearly as bad as Star Wars The Last Jedi, there were so many examples of such rank stupidity that I just, I barely even knew where to start. But there is one, and there's going to be a bit of a spoiler here for those of you who haven't seen the movie, but there's one example of the sort of thing that I'm talking about, and it boils down to what the bad guys are trying to do with the dinosaurs. They want to sell them off so that they can be weaponized. So there's a scene where they've got this room full of heads of states, of outlaw nations and international arms dealers, and they're auctioning off these dinosaurs to them. And the star of the show is, of course, the Indoraptor, developed by Dr. Henry Wu. And... They've trained this Indoraptor to react to certain stimuli. So they laser target to demonstrate what the Indoraptor can do. Don't worry, it's quite safe. It's inside a cage. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> um, and there's various different security people around the room, all armed with M4 carbines with various different attachments. And two of the attachments are um, a laser targeter and some kind of device that emits an ultrasonic blast. And the reason for this is because they've trained the Indoraptor to go after whatever the laser is pointing at and to attack when it hears this ultrasonic blast. Now, I think, although I can't remember precisely, that the bidding for this Indoraptor started at $50 million, or perhaps it ended at $50 million. I can't remember exactly, it's not really important. But it was lots and lots and lots of dollars. Millions upon millions and millions. Now, just think about this for a second. $50 million, or thereabouts, for a weaponized dinosaur that's trained to attack upon hearing an ultrasonic blast, trained to attack whatever target a rifleman is pointing his rifle at. Now, there's a question here. <laughs> There's a question here that I wanted an answer to, and it's apparently a question that never occurred to the makers of Jurassic World The Fallen Kingdom. If you've got a rifleman pointing his rifle at something that you want killed, just pull the trigger. <laughs> I mean, a 5.56mm NATO bullet only costs 20 cents. You get a lot of change from $50 million for a bullet. I can't help but feel that if you have a rifleman pointing his rifle at a target, you already have a solution to the problem that doesn't involve a $50 million dinosaur. And yet I appear to be the only person that this occurred to. And that, boys and girls, is the level of stupidity that you can expect if you're unfortunate enough to be watching Jurassic World The Fallen Kingdom. Please don't. I mean, it's too late for me, but... You know, if you haven't seen it yet, please don't, because you'll only encourage them to make more. Anyway, next up, there's an email that I received last week um, that I really wanted to read to you. Now, you're going to have to bear with me, because it is quite a long one. 
This is from Jonathan Rogers in Texas, and he said, Dear Jenkles, just watched your latest Assassin's Creed video and very much enjoyed it. In case you weren't already aware, I thought I might mention that even more of the events shown in the video were actually grounded in historical reality. In fact, the whole story with Mytilene actually featured as one of the most dramatic passages in Thucydides' account of the war. Cleon did urge the destruction of the rebellious city, and the angry citizens of Athens agreed with him. But the following day, after tempers had cooled, the Athenian citizens had second thoughts, and after a long debate that Thucydides recorded for his history, the Athenians narrowly decided not to destroy Mytilene. But, as you mentioned in the video, I wondered if in fact you were obliquely referring to it. I, I kind of was actually, because I was aware of this. The Athenians had already sent a ship with orders to have the city destroyed, and the populace either killed or sold into slavery. In order to reverse their decision, an Athenian naval crew pulled off an exploit worthy of the admiration of the saltiest veteran of Her Majesty's Royal Navy. A second ship was sent out with orders to catch up to the first ship, and they actually managed this by rowing around the clock for multiple days straight, only switching out crew members in order to sleep. Thucydides claimed that the crew even ate at their oars while rowing, consuming bread and barley cakes soaked in wine. The second ship just managed to enter the harbour at Mytilene as the Athenians were getting ready to carry out the orders of the first ship. Disaster was narrowly avoided. Also, Aristophanes did write a play aimed squarely at Cleon, which Cleon presumably saw in person, just like in the game. The quest in the game makes mention of the play, as it was called The Knights. The play features a ridiculous demagogue off, where Cleon and a vulgar sausage seller try to outdo one another, improving how shameless and unprincipled they are. I've always enjoyed Aristophanes' comedy. With a good enough translation, it's actually worthy of the best modern satire. Seriously, the creators of South Park and Aristophanes would get along brilliantly. Aristophanes' most famous comedy is called, I'll try to pronounce this, Lysistrata, and the plot involves the women of Athens and Sparta going on a sex strike against their husbands in order to end the Peloponnesian War. It's still performed today in some modern theatres. Anyway, as a veteran of the British school system, I expect you may well know all of this already. I did know, but not as a veteran of the British school system. I've read independently about the subject. Um, Jonathan has the good fortune of being a history teacher at a classical school in Texas, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to write to you. I've become a very regular viewer of your videos, and I've even occasionally watched them with my three-year-old son, although I'll have to be careful soon, or he'll start learning how to swear. <laughs> oh well, at least he knows what a tiger tank is. One final thing. Loved your commentary on the Gurkhas in the latest Mingles with Jingles video. It was an incredibly moving, and I'm saddened to hear how fast the memory of their extraordinary service to the British Empire is fading. I read about them as a kid at some point, and I can still recall seeing pictures of those combat knives they carry. Yeah, they're called kukris. Um, I'll tell you a story about that, actually, in a moment. Anyway, where were we? Uh, yes. Thank you for all the hours of enjoyment you've brought to me and my son, and thank you for doing such a wonderful job in helping keep historical knowledge alive and meaningful. Damn, can't shut myself up. Based partly on your description of Hans Joachim Marseille, the Star of Africa, you might recall that from a previous episode of Mingles with Jingles quite a while ago, I recently guided a student of mine towards writing his high school senior thesis on the biography of Marseille. This student has struggled some in the past, but I know him to be a long-time War Thunder player and a fan of World War II aviation. He was highly motivated to write on a World War II fighter ace and did a much better job on his thesis than he might have otherwise. So know that you have indirectly helped at least one high school student here in Texas. Okay, really finished this time. Thank you, Jonathan Rogers. Wow, well, where do I start? Um, well. I suppose the obvious place to start is to say, Jonathan, thank you very much for your message. And yeah, I do, as you probably noticed, in fact, as most of you have probably noticed, I do like taking the opportunity to use games to try to educate people and cultivate an interest in people in history, um, which is one of the reasons why I loved doing the Assassin's Creed videos as much as I did, and still do, because we're not quite finished. So I'm very happy that anything that I might have said or done has, even if just indirectly, helped one of your students uh, gain their high school history degree. So that's fantastic news. I did mention that I had a little story about the combat knives that the Gurkhas carry, the Kukris. Uh, I don't know if anybody listening has... In fact, let, I'll get a picture of one, because these things are evil. There you go, that's the Kukri. That's the Gurkhas combination utility tool and combat knife, and it is an absolutely evil weapon. It's more machete than knife, uh, and all the Gurkhas are issued with one. Now, 
The very first time I met a Gurkha, I can't remember exactly when it was, it must have been in the 1990s, I was at HMS Drake, which is the Royal Navy shore base in Plymouth. I can't remember exactly why I was there. And I can't remember exactly when I was there, but it must have been the early 1990s. And this was the very first time I'd actually met anybody from Nepal um, in general, and a Gurkha in particular, because in the cabin next to me, there was a Gurkha chef who I believe I can't remember specifically, but I think he was in Plymouth uh, doing a chef's course. And I got along with him quite well. He was a really nice guy. His name was Durga. And because at the time I'd heard of the Gurkhas and read about their exploits and knew about these knives that they carried, I asked Durga one day if I could see it. Now, unbeknownst to me at the time, there is apparently a tradition amongst the Gurkhas. Um, I don't know how seriously they take that tradition these days, but at the time, Durga certainly took it very seriously, but there is a tradition that if you're going to draw your cookery from its scabbard, it must drink blood. Now, I didn't know this at the time, so I got more than a little excited <laughs> when Durga drew his kukri and in the same motion whipped it back over his shoulder and sliced a very shallow cut into his earlobe and then with a flicking motion of his wrist got rid of any blood on the blade, although there wouldn't have been much, and then allowed me to have a look at it. And it was then that I understood the reason why Durga had all of these tiny little scars on the lobe of his right ear. <laughs> so, if you're squeamish about the sight of blood, don't go around asking any Gurkhas to show you their knives. Well, anyway, moving on to slightly more game-related issues. World of Warships, the carrier rework. It's been a couple of days now, things have started to show signs of calming down. There's still a long way to go, there's still a huge amount of balancing and tweaking that needs to take place before uh, the player base and wargaming are going to be happy or less angry. <laughs> Which kind of amounts to the same thing. But it has been a couple of days and people have had time to start getting used to it and to start adapting to it on both sides of the fence, both the carrier players and the cruiser, destroyer and battleship players. And in that time, I've seen some shit, man. <laughs> there are things that I think are ridiculously broken and just plain being exploited. Get it? Plain being? Yeah, no, never mind. Terrible joke. Anyway. Uh, and there are other things that are probably working as intended, but which nobody has figured out a successful counter to yet. Which, again, you know, give it some more time, we will undoubtedly see further developments. Now, I don't want to dwell on this subject too much in this issue of Mingles with Jingles, because I really want to dedicate an entire World of Warships video to it. But there are some things that I think Wargaming need to change, and... I think they could have explained a lot better, or even explained at all, which they haven't. Uh, and I'm talking about things like the sector reinforcement for anti-aircraft fire. Who even knows what that is? I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were a lot of World of Warships players out there listening to this video who have no idea what I'm talking about, because I'm seeing in chat during games players constantly complaining that their anti-aircraft fire is completely inconsistent. It either appears to be completely wiping out an entire squad or just doing nothing whatsoever. Now I'm pretty sure that there are probably two reasons for that. One of which is the F key abuse by aircraft carrier players, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But the other is almost certainly because a lot of these people have absolutely no idea that you are actually capable of reinforcing your anti-aircraft fire on one side of the ship over another. And that's what I mean when I say Sector AA Reinforcement. What you can do, and it's difficult to show this in a replay because for some reason patch 8.0 or 0 0.8.0, whatever the hell it is, the latest patch, the carrier rework patch, the replay files don't actually show the user interface where you're aiming the attacks of your carrier planes and you're defending against them using this Sector Anti-Aircraft Reinforcement. Now, Wargaming are in the process of addressing this lack of information. They have already done a How It Works video for aircraft carriers, but they haven't yet done, although they are doing one, a How It Works video for anti-aircraft fire. And so I've set up 
a training room to show you exactly the sort of thing I'm talking about. And I would not be at all surprised if many of you watching this video had no idea that this was even a thing. So here's the USS Des Moines, Tier 10 American cruiser, and I'm pressing the O key, and this is what I'm talking about. AA sector reinforcement. You pick which side of the ship you want to reinforce the anti-aircraft batteries. By default, on a cruiser, for example, like the Des Moines, it takes 10 seconds to switch the fire. But now, and you can see over the compass, one side of the ship is highlighted in green, down there in the bottom left corner. That tells you at all times which side of the ship has reinforced anti-aircraft fire. How much is it reinforced by? Well, it depends. At the moment, 125% on the engaged side and 75% on the disengaged side, but you can switch it at any time, again just by pressing the O key and selecting which side of the ship. And that UI element there appears and stays as long as you've got your finger held down on the O key. But none of this is visible in a replay, so unless you already knew about this, and I'm not entirely sure how you might because Wargaming still haven't done the How It Works video for anti-aircraft fire, um, Unless you've actually been watching a live stream, for example, where somebody like Flamu or Flambass or Isolate was playing a cruiser like the Des Moines and actually using this sector reinforcement, there's a very good chance that you may indeed have absolutely no idea that it was even a thing or how to do it. Now, by default, on a cruiser like the Des Moines, it takes 10 seconds to reinforce a sector or to swap from one side of the ship to the other, and it buffs the effectiveness of your anti-aircraft guns by 25%. But that's just by default. If you were to take, for example, the manual fire control for anti-aircraft armament skill, that will reduce the length of time it takes to reinforce or swap a sector by 20%, so on the Des Moines, down from 10 seconds to 8 seconds, and buff the amount of damage by a further 20%, so up to 145%. And it's different from ship to ship. I've seen examples where people in certain types of ships have managed to get that AA reinforcement up to 175%. And in some cases, reduce the time that it takes to swap from one side to the other to as little as, I think, four or maybe six seconds. But here's the thing. I mean, this is all good stuff, but how exactly are you supposed to know this? Okay, they haven't done the How It Works video on this yet, but they've definitely addressed it, whether that be on Reddit, whether that be on developer Q&A live streams on Twitch, or whether that be in other news articles on the website. But not everybody reads Reddit. Not everybody watches live streams on Twitch, and not everybody reads the articles on the portal page. There's nothing in the game to make you aware that this is even a thing. And so I am pretty sure that this is one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons why people are complaining that their anti-aircraft guns don't seem to be doing squat. But it's only one of the reasons. There is another reason, and this is, in my mind at least, a bit more of a problem. See, here's the thing. Since we've gone from controlling multiple squadrons of aircraft in a top-down, real-time strategy style of gameplay to taking direct control over single squadrons at a time, what used to happen once your aircraft had conducted their attack was you just pressed the F key to return them to the carrier and then got busy with either launching new aircraft or controlling the other squadrons that were already doing their stuff around the map. But that doesn't happen now. And... Wargaming decided that it was just going to be too much of a ball ache and too much downtime for a carrier player if they had to manually fly a squadron back to the carrier with nothing else to do because they're only controlling one squadron at a time once it had conducted its attack. But instead what happens now is that any time you can press the F key, your squadron immediately returns to the carrier while becoming invulnerable and you are returned to the carrier in order to launch another squadron. And so I am deliberately screwing up this attack in order to show you how this mechanic can be abused. So I've missed the strike, I've had a bunch of aircraft shot down, and there is no way I'm going to be able to turn these aircraft around and conduct a successful strike with the survivors without getting shot down. So I'm not even going to try, I just press the F key. The surviving aircraft are now returning to the carrier. They're 100% invulnerable. So I made a huge mistake. I completely cocked up that attack but I'm not really suffering any penalties from it because I pressed the F key. The survivors are invulnerable. They're heading back to the carrier where they're going to replenish the next squadron of attack planes. There's no way those returning aircraft should have survived that attack, but they are because I pressed F, so now they're invulnerable. And that means they're going to make it back to the carrier where they're going to replenish the next squadron of attack aircraft. I shouldn't be able 
to recycle a squadron of attack aircraft as quickly as that after cocking up an attack as badly as that. But I can, because I pressed the F key. Let's try it again with the torpedo bombers. Now, because I recorded this live in a training room, you can actually see the UI. So that's an Iowa. It's got some pretty impressive AA, although it's just a bot, so it's not using sector reinforcement. Here we go. Torpedoes away. The three aircraft that conducted that attack, they're still in the anti-aircraft fire bubble, but they're now invulnerable and are returning to the carrier. Now, this is just me against an Iowa in a training room, but imagine there was a Worcester on the far side of that Iowa who had his sector reinforcement up. And after conducting this second strike on the Iowa, I was going to have to fly into the Worcester's anti-aircraft fire and would almost certainly have the entire squadron shot down. Except I don't have to, because I just dropped the torpedoes on the Iowa. Torpedoes away. Uh, anti-aircraft fire is suddenly becoming a little stiff. Let's press the F key. <laughs> Saved all of the aircraft. And, and this, I am 100% certain, and also to a lesser degree, people just not knowing that they can reinforce their anti-aircraft fire sectors, but I'm convinced that this abuse of the F key aircraft recovery mechanic is the reason why people are just complaining so much when they're on the live server playing games at World of Warships that their anti-aircraft fire just doesn't seem to be doing anything. Even when they've got fully reinforced anti-aircraft sectors, and the defensive fire consumable going. It's because the carrier players are going, whoa, I made a bit of a mistake there, they're just pressing F. Aircraft invulnerable, safely recover the entire squadron. Gee, wouldn't it be nice if we realised that we'd overcommitted in the battleship and we could just press the F key to instantly and magically teleport back to the spawn and not suffer any consequences for making bad decisions? Well, tough, you can't. You screwed up, deal with it. Unless you're in an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah. I really think this needs to be addressed. And I'm going to go into it showing random battle examples of exactly this sort of thing and other little tricks from aircraft carrier players, particularly the Japanese Tier 10 carrier, the Hakuryu. There are some things you can do with that thing's torpedo bombers that are just disgusting. <laughs> but which aren't necessarily exploits, which this very definitely is. All of this coming up in a World of Warships video very, very soon, where you'll be seeing multiple in-game examples of the sort of thing that I'm talking about, and where I will at least be trying to be constructive and come up with some solutions or suggestions for how this sort of thing can be stopped. Anyway, that's it. I have a, I have a little cat yelling at me. <laughs> she badly wants some attention. Yes, Crystalline. Yes, you're a good cat. I don't know if you can hear it. You probably can. But that's it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you enjoyed it. Be very interested to know what you think of all this in the comments. And in the meantime, take care, and I'll catch you next time.